Welcome to Your Need to Know. I'm your host, Katherine Reed, and today we're talking with Katie Comerford, who is the Executive Director of Girls on the Run Northern Virginia. Thank you so much for being here today, Thank Katie. Thank you so much for having me, Katherine. I'm excited to be here. I am excited about your program. Great. I have been aware of it. I had a friend who actually was a volunteer at mm -hmm. her daughter's school Great. years ago, uh -huh. probably five years ago now, mm -hmm. and I've loved the concept of the program, but I think we were discussing the fact that a lot of people may not have any idea what you actually do. Yeah. So why don't you kind of explain the genesis of the program? Happy to. Well, um, Girls on the Run is a youth development organization that uses running as sort of a backdrop or a vehicle to reinforce some of the youth development competencies that we want to see in all of our young people. Um, so we really focus on building confidence, building physical and emotional competence, um, building a connection with other adults and other um, young people. Um, and also sort of building a healthy, ass, a healthy outlook on their own lifestyles going forward. So we really use, we use running as the way to sort of, um, at the risk of making a pun, to exercise all of the skills that we are, are building otherwise. So um, the girls spend 10 weeks training for a 5K, but along the way, they're actually learning a lot about teamwork. They're learning about those healthy relationships. They're growing mentorship. They're getting a mentor from a, a volunteer coach. Um, and along the way, they're also building the, the skills that they need to make a long-term plan and set a goal and actually achieve that goal. So at the end of the 10 weeks, they actually do run a 5K that Girls on the Run hosts, and it's for the girls, and we um, sort of see it as their graduation. But like any graduation, it's not about the, the graduation. So it's not always about the race, but it's really about the growth that they get along the way. So um, our mission is actually to, uh, we inspire girls to um, be joyful, healthy, and confident using this, this curriculum, which creatively uses running. So running is really your anchor activity. Absolutely. So that it's around the, but it's not about that. Absolutely. But it gives an anchor thing and it's, to me, it's kind of a metaphor too, mm -hmm. because it really is about, you know, you often hear people say, you know, life is a marathon, not a sprint. Mm -hmm. And so you have to build up both grit and resilience. And I would say that we hear a lot more of that discussion of helping girls in particular mm -hmm. to learn grit and to yep. learn resilience, which there's a lot of reasons that we get very mixed messages, uh -huh. starting with Disney princesses, mm -hmm. and it continues all the way through middle school. So talk a little bit about what the age range is for the girls in your program. Great question. Um, so we work um, with girls third through eighth grade. Um, we have two curricula. One is our standard Girls on the Run program, and that's really for girls third through fifth grade. Um, and it really does focus on sort of, the again, the developmental needs of girls in this age range. And then we have a middle school curriculum that we call Heart and Soul, and it's for girls 6th through 8th grade. And that curriculum is built from the ground up for girls in that age range. So we used to have another middle school program that was a really high quality program, um, but it was sort of a, a, the next step from Girls on the Run. And we, we were hearing from a lot of people like, that's just not right, you know, it just needs something a little bit different. So we went back and, and took a look at all of the needs of girls in that age range and some of the skills that they hopefully built at Girls on the Run, but it's also great for girls who have never done Girls on the Run. But it really takes a look at what the girls in middle school are really focusing on. So maybe it's a little bit more around leadership. The girls have a little bit more um, agency over the, the way that the, the practice will run that day. Um, and it's a little bit more around strength building, physical and emotional strength building. Well, middle school is just a very dicey time. Absolutely. I remember there was, there was a book that I read years ago called Reviving Ophelia, mm -hmm. in which yeah. you know the author, who was a psychologist, talked about uh -huh. how what a dangerous time middle school is. Mm -hmm young people, all young people, are living the, leaving their neighborhood elementary school and the friends that they've had since they were very young and they're being put into this larger school mm -hmm. and relationships change mm -hmm. and you are meeting new peer groups and girls are going through puberty which they usually do earlier than boys do. Certainly. So they are facing in the sixth, seventh, eighth grade something a little different from what boys that age mm -hmm. are going through at the time. And so I do think, I don't know if dangerous is the word, but a lot of how young women move through their teenage years is at a critical point in middle school. Yeah, absolutely. I like that you said dicey. 
That was, that's a great word. It's dicey. You know, because I think um, dangerous is relative. Right. Um, and honestly, the way that we look at, at all, you know, the way that, that children develop in general, um, it, there are, are different phases, and those, it's, it's not um, a, a specific time, you know, at, at 18 months you look exactly like this. Yeah. You know, it, it's, it's a little bit variable in some other environmental factors, and that's the same way with um, any sort of social development that we might have with a, a young person, early adolescent. Um, and I think you're right, so there's all kinds of new factors coming in, and um, you know, there's there's a range of, of sort of hormonal levels that the girls right. are dealing with, the way their bodies are changing, and the way that we're, their relationships are changing. Not to mention the factors and the messages that are coming in from their families, from media, from the, the lessons they're learning in school, the actual lessons they're learning, um, and some of the... Um, the, the sort of social lessons that they're learning. So we really think that heart and soul is is a great way for the girls to have this anchor. Like you said about the running, you know, having an anchor for the program. This program is an anchor for the girls to come be in a safe space with a qualified and trained adult who can sort of be there to bounce off some of these questions that the girls have. And they, the girls can bring it up in their own time, their issues, their, their concerns, um, things they're excited about. They can learn to be excited, you know, to celebrate all the great stuff that's going on, but also to, to build these great relationships with other girls to say, my body's different than yours, my issues are different than yours, but I'm still building a relationship with a peer that can support me and get me through sort of these tougher times that will sort of ebb and flow over the next few years. You know, we have found, um, and I, I mean we as a field, not just at Girls on the Run, that, um, you know, a girl's confidence peaks at a very young age. Oh, it does. If, gr if girls were just in elementary school all the way, we would rule the world because we rule elementary school. But I've ex described it to somebody as girls taught to lose their power mm -hmm. about 11, 12. Yeah. And then and somebody asked, actually asked me, what do you, somebody who has daughters actually asked me, I don't even know what you're talking about. What do you mean they lose their power? Mm. I'm like, suddenly they become self-conscious. Yeah. Suddenly it's not cool to be smart. Yeah. Suddenly it's not cool to raise your hand to answer the question. Yeah. Suddenly how you see yourself is too much influenced by how the people around mm -hmm. you are starting to give you signals about what it means to be confident or to be smart or to know the answer to things. Right. And I think that that's hard to get back. So we really believe that it, it's an early intervention. You know, it's preventative, the work that we can do. So, you know, if we can actually fortify that confidence before the age of nine, before the age of 10, then it's gonna erode much more slowly. And the girls are actually gonna have the tools they need to resist some of the forces that are helping to erode that confidence. Because we see that when the girls are losing their power, and I love that you said power, because it's true. They lose their power, they, yeah. They, they, they lose the power to make the decision to be as strong as they can be. And we really are, our focus is really building confident and strong, healthy women. So as much as we are here for the girls, and we are 100%, you know, we really want them to have a great time, have so much fun being girls and being wild and being strong and running, um, finding their own pace, slow as it may be, fast as it may be. Right. What we really want is for them to carry those lessons with them through a lifetime. Every day, Catherine, a, an adult woman tells me that they wish they had had a program like Girls yes. on the Run. Yes, yes, yes. And it indeed. is powerful. I, you know? I, can, I can see how it is powerful. Mm -hmm. The other thing I like about it is the fact that it is teaching them how to be in a community with other girls, mm. which I think grown women will also say sure. that we were not taught. You know, adolescence is plagued with insecurity. It is plagued with image issues. It is mm -hmm. plagued with these mixed signals you're getting about being attractive and popular and but also being smart and you know, you're rewarded for different things that are sometimes in conflict. Right. And because of our insecurities we have a tendency not to see ourselves as being in a community of women. Right. And so to me Girls on the Run is, is this idea mm -hmm. that you can be among a group of people who support you right. who are also women. Right. Absolutely. And you know um, we mentioned our coaches. I think it's, a, it's really important for us to highlight our coaches. So we have, um, every year, we have about 500 community members who, without any sort of monetary compensation, are giving their, their time and their talent and, and their, their hearts 
to our girls. Um, and they're not just women, they um, are mostly women, I will tell you that. There aren't a lot of uh, male coaches, but we, we love um, to have men who coach with us. But what we do want to make sure of is that our head coaches, and every team has about, about three um, adult coaches, our head coaches are always women because we always want our girls to see women in a leadership position Absolutely. with girls on the run because we want them to be able to envision themselves as leaders however they decide to define leadership but they we want them to have that example at all times you know and that is reflected in real life you know I work a lot with nonprofit mm -hmm. agencies mm -hmm. and there's a lot of nonprofits that are run entirely by women but yeah. if you look at who is head of the board or oftentimes who is head of the nonprofit mm -hmm. it isn't women Mm. And you know, that's a visual cue, why not? And yeah. so I agree with you. Yeah. They need to see women in leader. If you can't see it, you can't be it. I agree, I agree. And we, we really do wanna make sure we have this example for the girls at all times. We wanna have an example of, of a strong adult relationship, adult-child relationship that is safe, that is um, without judgment, um, and is really just overall supportive and we think it's really important for girls to have strong relationships with men as well as women but just as you said if you can't see it you can't be it and we actually think that it's really important for girls to be in this space with other girls and then we do get questions you know what about boys on the run or why why just a single sex program and we think there's definitely um, there's definitely room in the world for programs just for boys and definitely room for co-ed programs because girls having relationships with boys that are their peers are also really important. But we also think there's space for girls on the run, a space where girls can see it, see a positive relationship with another girl and without distraction um, really build a, a very solid friendship and supportive peer relationship with another girl. And what we believe will grow into supportive relationships with teenage girls and other adult women in their in their later lives there there is something to be said for single sex programs mm -hmm. you know they've done a lot of studies on women's colleges yeah. and the um, the number of leaders who come out of women's colleges mm -hmm. And part of it is is that you become a leader among your peer group. Absolutely, really, that is not, this is not the same dynamic, is pitting, usually more aggressive mm -hmm. males. And this is the thing that you know in adolescence, males become more aggressive. That is like mm -hmm. the, that's what their bodies do. That's what their hormones mm -hmm. do. Mm -hmm. And you find that they tend to dominate more of the space that they're in. And so it's important to have a space where you're you don't have that additional factor yes. of someone trying to take up more space. And when we come back from our break, I'm mm -hmm. going to talk to you a little bit more about the girls that are in your groups, Great. the schools where you have the program, and where the program exists outside the school system. Excellent. So please join us after this break as I continue to speak with Katie Comerford, who's the Executive Director of Girls on the Run, Northern Virginia. <laughs> to tell which kids have trouble with their eyesight. But that's not always the case. Even though one in four children may have a vision problem, eye doctors tell us the symptoms aren't always so obvious. We do know that 80% of all childhood learning is visual. And without good vision, kids can have trouble learning to read. And may fall behind in school. For clues on how to spot the real life signs of childhood vision problems and what parents can do, visit checkyearly.com. A public service message from the Vision Council of America and reading is fundamental. to know. I'm your host, Katherine Reed, and today we are talking with Katie Comerford, who is the Executive Director of Girls on the Run Northern Virginia. And I so appreciate you being here to talk about this program that many people may not be familiar well, with. I love talking about it, so I could go on for days. <laughs> so you, the program started in the school system, mm -hmm. but that's not everywhere your program is. Right. So tell us a little bit, how many schools are you in, and sure. what, where are the programs 
also taking place that people can access. Great. So um, we are Girls on the Run Northern Virginia. So Girls on the Run is actually a national program, um, but I'm talking today just about the Northern Virginia footprint. And um, so I work specifically with Loudoun, Prince William, Fairfax, Arlington, in Alexandria, um, sorry. Yeah. <laughs> That's a big footprint. It is a big footprint, and then all of the, the smaller um, municipalities inside of them. Um, so we actually partner with about 140 different schools within that footprint. Um, and primar that's primarily where our partnerships lie. So um, we have before and after school programs at those schools, and they meet twice a week for about an hour to an hour and a half, depending on um, the kind of access they have to the facilities. Some of our programs are actually not at schools. Um, some of them aren't private schools, of course, but some of them are also at community centers. Um, so we have a partnership starting up with some um, apartment complex, some um, oh, wow. mixed income housing complexes. So That's great. Yeah, it's, it's amazing. That's exciting. It is exciting because then it's really closer to home. So the girls are getting home, then they're able to go to the community center that's um, right in their neighborhood and have the program there. And that actually would take place perhaps on a weekday and a weekend, which um, is a barrier to having just just a school-based program is that we only have access during the week. I think this is very exciting because it I think is. transportation to get to a program, to get home from mm -hmm. a program, if, you, if you've got a parent who's working three jobs, yep. clearly that, and the expense because mm -hmm. there is a fee involved. So tell us a little bit about how sure. you are making sure it's available to more girls. Right. Well, you know, Catherine, even free programs have a fee. Right. And just like you mentioned, the, the transportation. Um, so even if the program comes at no cost, perhaps a girl can't be in the program because her family can't afford to come get her after school. They can't afford to leave work early um, to come after the bus has left the, the school premises. Um, so that is a barrier to participation, frankly, that um, the girls have to go home on the bus because otherwise they're not going to make it home. So that can be a, a challenge and one that we're working on and looking at different partnerships um, so that the girls can have a safe way to get home after the program. But most of our girls um, participate um, on a, a fee service. It's a, a fee level. So it's a sliding scale. So the, the full fee is $175 for a 10-week after-school program, which is pretty average. Um, but then it actually slides down to $22 for the entire season. And we actually base um, the sliding scale on a few different factors. Mostly it's um, financial aid based on a family's eligibility for free or reduced, reduced lunch. lunches. Yeah. yeah. So that's a really easy way for us it is. to it's verify to and we don't have to, you know, um, make the family sort of provide anything they wouldn't otherwise be providing the school. And we actually keep the, um, the, the level of payment that the families are making confidential. So it follows the family, not the school, which is also a little bit different. Um, and then we also offer a couple of other opportunities because in Northern Virginia, um, you know, the, uh, the income rates are, are very wide. And just because a family doesn't qualify for free or reduced lunch doesn't mean that they are having- They can afford extras like this exactly. program. Making ends meet is still hard. So we try to justify a few other um, uh, discounts along the way, one of which is a coach's discount. So if a coach, one of our volunteers, if his or her daughter um, is participating in the program, they get a significant discount um, as a thank you for their right. service. Um, and then we also have discounts for f military families. Um, and also for siblings. So um, military families has actually been one that's close to our heart because it's such a big part of our population right, in Northern is. Virginia. Um, and especially for people who are just moving to the area and they didn't expect the cost of living to be what it is. Oh, it's incredible, isn't yeah. it? The sticker shock. It, yeah, yeah. <laughs> exactly. So we, we do work very hard to make the program accessible to all girls who want to participate. So that is actually, you know, Girls on the Run is a nonprofit organization and some people don't realize that because we are a fee-for-service program. Um, but, you know, 40% of our girls get some kind of a discount and most of them are on financial aid. So we really work very hard to raise money to make sure that we can provide the program to as many girls who, as who want it. So this is one of the ways that people can support your program, oh, yeah. whether or not you have a a girl in one of these programs mm -hmm. or you have children in school at all. Right. For people who value what you're trying to do, mm -hmm. this is something where people know that the money they donate goes a long way to helping Absolutely. offset the cost for young girls who can't afford to do this. Yep. 
Um, I would also think that corporate sponsorships must be something mm -hmm. that you're looking for too. Is yeah. that, you know, this is a program, it's evidence-based, you've got mm -hmm. years of experience, I'm sure you have data and metrics to yeah. show how many girls you have served. Absolutely. And especially after all these years, some of the earliest girls in the program must be in high school right, now. Right, right. So Girls on the Run Northern Virginia has been around for 17 years. Right, so they're out of high yeah. school and they're out of college <laughs> even, right? <laughs> Absolutely. So you need an alumni fundraising yep, campaign yep, for these, yeah. these people. but. But I do think that programs like this that have a proven track record mm -hmm. is a, a safe repository for people's donations. Right. And I would hope that there's mm -hmm. a number of organizations, whether it's corporate donations or faith communities too, yeah. that could offset you know, providing this service to more girls. Absolutely. And you know, um we feel very it feels very non-controversial to us you know that, right. that we're, we're supporting young people in character development um, specifically girls who, who tend to sort of lose out on some of those chances otherwise um, specifically the girls who are the beneficiaries of our fundraising are girls who have um, you know their access to programs like ours is, is a little bit out of their reach and so we really want to be able to put the programs right in front of them and so like you said faith-based organizations are um, are a great option for us in terms of partnering for, um, for further growth of our girls and, and broader access. We are very proud of some of the corporate partnerships that we have that, that bring the 5K to everybody to have this really special event for girls. Um, but we have a lot of small businesses also who support what they can and a little goes a long way for us. You know, we really can do very <laughs> a, a great lot deal. with a little bit. Exactly, of exactly, thank you. Well, because you've got so many volunteers, so the, yes. the, the whole f coaching force is yep. volunteers. Absolutely, and you know, a lot of our coaches are actually teachers, which is is really special because they've put in a full day at the school and they're willing to spend another couple of hours there with the girls on this curriculum because they see how important it is not just for the girls but the, the entire classroom a lot of them are teachers a lot of them are parents but so many of them are community members who come to us and they say I just want to participate I just want to be a coach and I really want to have this relationship with a team of girls and actually that's how I got involved with girls on the run I was a coach I was a volunteer at girls on the run DC and I was at a point in my career where I could go after school a couple of times a week, and it was a really, really powerful experience for me as an adult woman to, uh, adult woman to sort of sort of be remembering these lessons all over again and seeing the, the genesis of the relationships that um, really do flourish over time, for better or for worse. And so knowing that, um, you know, with just a couple hours a week, in, the, in an afternoon, you could really make such a powerful impact on the girls. It was really, really fantastic, and so. You know, that is an interesting, because I've been, I mentored a second grader all year at oh, my great. local elementary Good. school. Thank Just you. one child, and, yeah. but what I'm thinking in terms of is that there are a lot of businesses that give their employees time off mm -hmm. to do volunteer work. Absolutely. And so I'm thinking in my own mind, maybe outreach to business who are yeah. like, you know, we have an employee population and mm -hmm. giving them time off for 10 weeks to do this yeah. every week would be a good way to support the program mm -hmm. through their employee base. Absolutely. And, you know, in addition to that, they they will also support the organization that the right. volunteer is supporting. So they say, you know, if that's important to you as one of our employees, it's important to us. And that is a really, really great way to sort of make a, a double impact on the community, not Absolutely. only in the time, but also and the dollars for doers that will, could follow. You know, a lot of people just haven't thought of it. You know, a lot of a yeah. lot of good ideas are like, I didn't think of that. Yeah. But yes, I have employees, and mm -hmm. we could actually give them time off to do this right. in addition to our corporate support. Absolutely. Can we talk a little bit about the multicultural nature of the groups? Because sure. we are a very diverse Northern Virginia, you more bet. than probably a lot of other school mm -hmm. systems. Mm -hmm. Lots of different nationalities. Lots mm -hmm. of kids from coming from different cultures. Yep. whose parents come from di different cultures. Certainly. You know, do you see that there? You've got a very diverse group. We do. Schools? You know, we um, we've had a, a track record, frankly, of our, our diversity. So the, the diversity that we track in our registration maps on to Northern Virginia as a whole. So that's been really interesting for us to talk about that um, that we really do tend to serve a population that matches the population of the region. You know, some of the time we also think about um, whether or not we're still reaching everybody who needs us. So. Um, 
we want to talk a lot more about um, making sure that we have materials available in different languages, making sure that we have registration available in different languages. So not just the curriculum materials, but are we able to get on the phone and help out a, a parent who doesn't speak English and turn, walk them through the registration process or make sure that our coaches are multilingual. Um, so that's something we definitely try to keep an eye on. And of course, as you know, sort of the, the way that the, the communities around Northern Virginia will have different pockets of, of right. ethnic representation. It's something that we are definitely mindful of in Annandale versus Leesburg, for instance. Right, right. Yeah, you're right, because people tend to cluster together yeah. in communities mm -hmm. of people who are from their culture. Yeah, and absolutely. So I do think you see that mirrored in the yeah. neighborhoods and in the schools. And actually, I, I think it's actually one of the benefits of partnering with schools is because the schools are so mindful of that that we can oftentimes follow their lead and really take cues from them on how to best support our communities. I love the idea that you're taking this to like you know, apartment complexes mm -hmm. and places where the transportation is not an yeah. issue. If you yeah. could do this on a Saturday morning and nobody has to get a ride there. Yep. So how do you see expanding that? What would it take for you to be able mm -hmm. to expand that program where people actually live? Yeah, you know, a lot of times, um, of course, it takes funding and takes support so that we can actually bring the program and the, the curriculum, the, the training, the support um, to a new location, especially a location where we're not sure we could attract as many people. It takes a little bit to get off the ground. Um, but we also see that happening, you know, I kind of think wherever there are groups of children, we could go there. So right. I think about churches, a lot yeah, of me churches too. I mean, have, Yeah, they have space. The one they thing have they have is space. They have space for rainy day programs. Right. They could, you know, if no one's, you know, around the, the perimeter, we could definitely use that space for a lot of our, our physical activity. I think about libraries um, because, you know, they're usually in centralized locations. There's parking available there. Again, there's good rainy day activities. Um, there could be so many different options for us. Schools are always going to be a great option for us, but um, when we think about um, just any area that might really have a lot of young people. So existing community programs with recreation centers, um, always good options for us. We really just need to make sure that there's enough space for the girls to, to do the physical activity workout, a place for them to meet indoors or outdoors so they can have the, the lesson that, that leads into their activity, and to make sure there's some rainy day activities as well because rain will happen, as will snow. That is so true. Mm -hmm. And so the message we want to leave with people is there's lots of ways they can support yes. you through donations. They can look to their faith communities. They mm -hmm. can look around their neighborhood mm -hmm. yeah. to see where there are a lot of children. They can yeah. see if the local library, and they can advocate. Mm -hmm. You know, the one thing that people can do that they don't often think of besides write a check is like, how can I advocate for the resources or the communities I'm already in right. to bring this program? Because Absolutely. I know there are girls here who would benefit from right. it. Exactly. Thank you so much, Katie Thank Comerford. Thank you, Catherine. I, I, appreciate appreci I appreciate you being here. And this is what you need to know.